Amen. Thank you. I wanted to thank everyone also for remembering my birthday last week. It seems so long ago now, but it was only a week ago. But uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the cards, the notes that people wrote to me. Everyone was so kind, and I really do appreciate it. So thank you for, for that. Take your Bible, please. The Lord put a word on my heart to share today. Now, this is one of those times when at 9 o'clock I didn't get through the whole thing. So I'm going to try to do the same thing at this one. And then uh, next Sunday is Mother's Day, so we have a special thing on that day. So in two weeks from today, Lord willing, we'll finish up the, uh, this message. If, unless I finish it today, which who knows, maybe I will. But I don't think if I do that, then I'm stuck for next. Well, forget it. It's too complicated. <laughs> so we're reading First Kings 17. Verses 8 through 16. I'm going to ask Pamela to read it while I work okay. on my glasses. Okay, I'll be pastor's eyes. Okay, okay. I'm reading Kings 1, 8 through 16, 17. Okay. Okay. Hold on one second. 1 Kings 17. Okay. Okay. All right. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Seraphath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Seraphath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the oil of the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. You can take that. <clears throat> Thank you, Pamela. So I want to talk to you today about the great prophet Elijah, great prophet to Israel, and the unnamed widow of Zarebeth. I've entitled the message today, Make the Most of What You Have. And uh, the idea is that we're going to see how God often does two things at the same time. As in this case, uh, He supernaturally provides for His servants. And in doing so, as in Elijah's case, provides or blesses someone else in the process. And I want to start this by saying, these questions are what we should be asking ourselves. What does God want me to do? What does God want to do with me? What does God want to do through me? How can I be used by the Lord? So make the most of what you have. What do you have that God wants? What do you have that God could use? 
What, could, what do you have that God could use to bless somebody else? And I know, because I've been here a million times, some of you are thinking, I'm not the most talented, I'm not the most gifted, I'm not the sharpest tack in the box, I'm not the prettiest or the handsomest or the strongest or the, the healthiest, and you're probably right about all those things. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. So the question remains, what do you have to offer God that He could use to bless somebody else? I want to just wax philosophical here for a moment, but Scripture tells us in many places, but Psalm 139 in particular, that God formed us in our mother's womb. He knew us before we were born. He knows the length of our days that are fashioned for us. He even knows the number of hairs on our heads. And when I read Ephesians 2.10, which is one of my favorite scriptures, we read that we are God's workmanship. And you probably heard me say this, but I have to say it again. The word for workmanship in the Greek, I don't know what it is right now, but what it means is we are His creation. We are His masterpiece. We're His composition. We're His song being written. We're His poem being written down. We're, we're His artwork being created. So when I think about that about me, and about anybody, I think, wow, we are all so uniquely different and so uniquely special. We're God's workmanship created for good works that He prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So my question to the churches today, those of you at home today, is are you walking in those good works today? And can you see yourself as a character in the Bible that God has changed and God has used for His purposes? I mean, when I read the Bible, often I'll say, well, I could relate to that guy or that person or that story. And I put myself in the story. I think, could you relate to Peter, who was a fisher of fish, who became a fisher of men. And God just used his talents and just switched them around to be a great evangelist for the Lord. Or Matthew, who would collect tax money from the Jews to give it to the Romans. He must have been a very detailed person. He knew how to keep records. And how God used him to put together an account, we call it the Gospel of Matthew, of the life and death and passion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he blessed Israel with that. Or can you think of yourself as maybe Thomas, who flat out denied the Lord, that didn't believe in the Lord, that He rose from the dead, but when he saw and believed, he stayed faithful till the very end of his life, serving the Lord. So think back on your life and your situation, your circumstances, and how God brought you through whatever you went through to end up where you are today. I think about this a lot. I think about my life. Back in the day, I loved the Beatles. I loved music. I loved guitar. Whoever would have thought back then that God would be using that passion to worship Him with. But that's what God does. I think of uh, my life growing up in the, in the household with my mom and dad. My father was a house painter. And uh, we learned all the lingo about house painting, the priming and the scraping and the sanding and, and, uh, and all this stuff, patching. And, 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 I thought we, and I would work for my father for many years, seven years I worked with my father painting homes. And we were in the business of fixing things up and making them look good, making them look better than what they looked before. And then I, 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 I somehow I, I got that in my mind and spirit, and now I'm doing that for the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm patching up people's lives. I'm painting over people, not with paint, but with the blood of Jesus. I'm fixing not walls, I'm fixing people. But so that, that's what God wants to do. He wants to use whatever we have for His glory and for His purposes. And I, I want to really encourage you, what do you have to offer God? And if you're anything like me, I, I think, you know, I would think back on my life and when I first came to the Lord, I'd hear preachers preach. I'd hear these stories of the older saints that were, did great things for God. And I would say to myself, man, I could never do stuff like that. But as the clock was ticking, as time was going, as I didn't deviate from my commitment to be in the Word and be, be the Lord's, you know, the Lord's uh, servant, the Lord showed me little by little that I could do something for God. I remember the first time I realized I could play my guitar in church. 
I mean, now it's common. But back in those days, it was revolutionary to, to deviate from the piano and the organ in church. Have an acoustic guitar, that was like new. I thought, wow, this is, this is all right. God could use me just the way I am, whatever talent I have. So let me, let me go through this story here, and then we're going to talk about it. So 1 Kings 17. The, the story is this, if, if you look at verse number 1. Elijah is a prophet. He's a great prophet, great man of God, uh, prophet to Israel. And uh, by the way, the first time we hear of Elijah is in 17 verse 1. It, he just kind of comes in out of the blue. And later on, he's, he's raptured in a whirlwind. He leaves quickly, as, just as quick as he came, he leaves. But anyway, he's a man of God, he's a prophet, and the Lord uses him to tell Israel that there's going to be a famine in the land for three years. Well, okay. So he's in the same proximity of King Ahab, who was the wicked king of Israel, his wife, Queen Jezebel. Uh, they were evil people, but they were the leaders of Israel. And so the Lord tells Elijah, there's going to be a famine, and... Uh, he sends Elijah uh, to be a, a spokesperson to Israel, to show Israel and to show the nations that in spite of the famine, God is greater. And God is able to provide, and He will do it. So the story goes on, verse number 8 and 9. He, the Lord says, go to Zarephath, and a widow will be there to care for you, to help you. So he goes, verse number 10, he goes there. And, uh, and note the similarities of, uh, in John chapter 4, the, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. There are similarities here to the two, two stories. But he goes down there, he finds this uh, widow in verse number 10. It says that she's, uh, she's gathering sticks. Now that's an interesting way to describe what she's doing. But remember, there's famine. There's no produce, there's no livestock, there's no, there's no uh, food to eat. So she's looking for little twigs in the ground to make some type of a cake or a patty or something. And, uh, and so she does that. And he says to her, bring me some water. And uh, verse number 11, uh, as, he was go as she was going to get it, he says to her, and I just think like an afterthought, oh, bring me some bread while you're at it. So bring me some water and bring me some bread. And then in verse number 12, we see that uh, she recognized him as being a, a man of God. She says uh, in verse number 12, the Lord your God, uh, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have bread. So she's recognizing him as being different than her. And so she says, I don't have anything. I don't have any bread. I'm poor. All I have is this little bit of flour, this little bit of oil. And uh, I'm going to make something for myself and for my son. And we're going to eat, and then we're going to die. She's done. She's destitute. She's poor. She's po poverty stricken. She's beside herself. And she's probably wondering, who is this person asking me to bless them and help them when I don't even have enough for myself? So uh, Elijah says in verse 13, do not fear. Do not fear. Go on as planned. Feed me first, because he's thinking God gave me a promise that he would take care of me. And then you'll have enough for yourself and for your son. And she obeyed. And the oil and the flour never ran out, and she fed her family for a long, long time until it rained again, according to the word of the Lord. So that's basically the story. But there's a lot of things to say about this story. And so I want to go through it little by little, but I want to keep in mind Ephesians 2.10. And I want everyone to remember, we are God's workmanship. We are God's creation that he, he prepared things for us to do before that we should walk in them. So we have to be walking a certain way to make the most out of what we have. If we're not walking a certain way, whatever we have will be wasted. I can remember before, the days before I was a Christian, my life was basically filled with frustration because I could never seem to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. And it was, it was hard, it was difficult, it was, it was sad, it was, it, was, it was not right. But when I became a Christian person, and God blessed me with a beautiful wife, and my life got on track, it seemed like all the pieces came together, and I'm still walking in that blessing of being a new creation in Christ. So uh, there's several things I want to talk about. And uh, so the idea here, here is, if you want to make the most out of what you have, you have to walk a certain way. Okay, so number one, the first thing is, we see it in verses one through six, you have to walk with God. Is that an understatement? If you ever want to be who you're supposed to be, you have to walk with God. You're never going to get there if you're not walking with God. So Elijah was a, a man of God, he was a prophet. 
Um, it says in verse number two that he, he heard the word of the Lord. The, the, the word came to him. He heard it. Verse number five, he went out and did according to what the, the word of God said. So if you want to, if you think you have something to give, something to offer, you have something to give to the world, right? Give to your family. What I'm saying is until you get right with God, those things will probably not be fulfilled in your life because he's got the key to let the real you out in the way that he wants you to be out. So we, we see this. So verse number one, uh, Elijah's walking with God. Um, we, we need to walk with God. But in verse number four, the Lord tells him to go down to the brook, uh, the brook Shareth, verses three, verse four. Go down to the brook Shareth and drink the water from the brook. This is symbolic of the living waters of the Holy Spirit. If you want to fulfill your life and, and make the most out of what you have, you must give your life to God and be, and be drinking of the living waters of the Holy Spirit. We had a taste of that this morning during worship time. I don't know if you were aware of it. The living water was flowing through this place. A word came, a prophetic word, and, and a brother came and shared a word. God, that's God moving. We've got to be in that atmosphere of the Holy Ghost anointing if we're going to fulfill whatever we are supposed to fulfill in life. I'll guarantee you that word that came forward today will bless you tomorrow if you let it. But you've got to be living in the Spirit of God. You've got to be at the brook Sherith drinking of that living water that the Lord has for you. In verses, verse number 5, it says that, that Elijah stayed by the brook Sherith. I like that analogy. He stayed where the water was running. That means he stayed in the presence of God. He stayed where the Lord was moving and providing. He stayed where there was life, where there was spirit. My translation is he stayed in church. He stayed in fellowship. He stayed with the people of God. And the spirit of God was moving powerfully in his heart. And he kept drinking of that living water from the brook. Church, if you want to make the most of what you have, I'm telling you, you've got to be filled with the Spirit of God. Otherwise, you'll be frustrated. And you'll never achieve that stature of a person that God wants you to achieve. But not only the living water, it says in verse number 5 and 6, that the ravens came. This is unusual, but Elijah had many unusual things happen. But ravens came and brought him meat and brought him bread in the morning and in the evening. And so Elijah's all set. He's got the living water. He's got the manna from heaven, food from heaven. And that meat and that bread is symbolic of the word of God. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So he's drinking the water. He's eating the food that God provides. And he's well on his way to be who he's supposed to be. And he faced a lot of difficulties in his life, a lot of obstacles in his life as a prophet of the Lord. So if we want to make the most out of what we have, what I'm saying is we've got to get right with God. Number one, we've got to let God into our lives. We have to re receive his forgiveness and we have to stay plugged in to the living water and the spiritual food from the Word of God. That's number one, if we want to fulfill what we have. Now, some are parents, some are grandparents, some are workers, some have different talents and giftings. What I'm saying is, until you get this straightened out, all of those things will be frustrated in your mind and in your spirit. You may do them. You may have a degree of success, but you won't achieve that degree of stature that the Lord has for you. You are His workmanship. You're His creation. So he made each of us, you know, fearfully and wonderfully made, we, we are. And so we, as we give our life to him, as we feed of his spirit, drink of his spirit, feed of his word, we fulfill that calling of who we are as a man or woman. Number two is this, verse number seven. We've got to learn how to walk through problems. I don't know where this lie came from, that when you become a Christian, all your problems go away. That's not my experience. It's just that my problems are dealt with differently because I have a God that loves me and navigates my life through those problems. Problems don't go away. I could write a book about that. <laughs> and I could also write a book about the solution to the problems, how God has been faithful to them. But verse number seven, guess what? That brook dried up. The brook dried up. The Lord said there's going to be a famine and a drought. 
So not that God stopped moving in that way. He, he just moved in a different way from here on out. But there are times in our, our lives when we have dry times, when God seems silent, when the blessings seem to be on hold right now. And we don't understand what's going on. But can you imagine, Elijah, well, the, the brook runs dry. What am I going to do now? Well, verse number 8, then the word of the Lord came. And this is what the Lord does. When one door closes, another one opens. When one blessing finishes or ends, another one begins. When one anointing fades, another anointing begins to fall. So somehow in life, we've got to learn how to navigate through the issues of life. Proverbs says to guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. We have to learn how to walk pensively, walk carefully through life. It's difficult. Raising a family, paying bills, car issues, relational issues, all these different things, work problems. We need to know, learn how to navigate our path through the problems of life. I always look back when I, when I meet people that have been around a long time and, and they tell me their story, how God helped them through some difficulties here and some difficulties there, and how much wiser they are for it. So if we want to reach the, the if we want to do the most of what we have, we've got to, number one, give our life to God, get right with God, walk with God. In fact, I, I would like to, to say, how many times has someone said about you, Oh, I know them. They walk with God. That's a high compliment. Would people know that you walk with God? Not by your, you know, how strong you preach, but how you live your life. Will, will people know that you walk with God? And will people know that you walk through your problems? You're, you're, <laughs> you're drama-free, if I could use that phrase. At least more so than others. <laughs> you're, you're, you keep the drama to a minimum of life, and, and you navigate through the problems that you come across. See, this will help us to fulfill the calling that we have as a man or woman of God. This will help us make the most out of what we have, to learn how to walk with God, learn how to walk through problems with God. Number three is this, we need to learn how to walk in faith, verses 8 through 10. And, and, and we have to understand a little bit about Zarephath to understand the meaning of the story. Some of you may remember the story of when David wanted to bless one of King Saul's sons or grandsons. His name was Meshibabeth. And, and David was trying to find this young man. And he couldn't find him. And finally someone said, oh, he's, he's down in Lodabar. Lodabar. What's Lodabar? Lodabar was a city that was despicable. It was filled with poverty, sickness, disease. It was, it was a terrible place to go. But this guy who was crippled was cast out to Lodabar. I say that because Zarephath is really no better than Lodabar. But the Lord says to Elijah, go to Zarephath and uh, there, there'll be someone there to help you. Zarephath was farther away from Jerusalem. It was the center of Baal worship. It was where King Ahab and Queen Jezebel lived. You may remember in 1 Kings 18 and 19, the story of the battle of the, the prophets of Baal and, and the Lord's prophets, how they had the battle of the, consuming the offering. Well, that's where the Lord told him to go to, a place of ungodliness, unholiness, a place of rebellion. And so the Lord says, Elijah, the brook dried up. I want you to go to Zarephath. I could just picture Elijah saying, what? Why would I want to go to Zarephath? But every time in our lives, there's going to be a moment of decision when we've got to decide, am I going to follow God or not? To Abraham, the Lord said, follow me. I'll show you where you're going to go. To the church, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Just go and do it. I'll be with you. So for, for Elijah to go to Zarephath, he must have a walk of faith. Scripture says, without faith... It's impossible to please God. Without faith, we have no belief in the cross, in the empty tomb. We have no belief in the second coming of Christ. Without faith, preaching is useless. And so if we want to make the most of what we have, we have to be a person of faith, believing, applying, trusting, doing the things that the Lord has for us. 
Now, the word Zarephath, if I could just press in a little bit, means purification. In Zarephath, there were metal workers that would melt down the, the metal and purify it, make it nice and perfect, and make these idols for their false gods. And the Lord is telling Elijah, you go to Zarephath, there I will purify you, I will cleanse you, I will fix you. And so, if he wanted to make the most of that situation, he had to be obedient to what God was telling him to do. It's, so, we have to be a people of faith. We have to be a people that will put God first and step out in faith and trust him. In verse number 10, Elijah says, he arose and he went. So, the next thing is, we have to learn, in verses 10 through 12, we have to learn how to walk with people. And everybody said. <laughs> and everybody said. See, a lot of people will say, I, I'm good with God, I don't need anybody around. And, but time and time and time again, the Lord always reminds us, it's about people. It's not about your name or your success. It's not about money or your achievements. It's not about things. It's always about people. So in verses 10 through 12, we see that Elijah goes down to Zarephath, and he meets this, this, uh, this uh, Gentile woman who is a widow that has a son, a very unlikely combination. And... But it's a person with a soul. It's a person with a spirit. It's a person with opinions and a person with a history. And if we're going to make the most out of our lives and make the most out of what we have, we would do well to really get along with people and learn from people and, and realize people bring us the most joy in life. I heard this thing on the radio recently that Jesus was always around people. And we do our best when we're around people. When we're not around people, guess what? We're lonely. When we say goodbye to people, we're lonely. We go back home alone, we're sad. We need people in our lives. And if we're, if we're going to fulfill who we are and what we have, we have to learn to get along and thrive with other people. People will challenge us. People will stretch us. People will bother us. But it's like iron sharpening iron will be better as a result of being around people. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're around people today? I hope so. I hope so. Let me continue on here. Number five is this, verses 13 and 14. We need to walk with confidence. Not pride per se, but just a confidence that our God is able. In verse number 13, we read, Elijah said to her, and she gives the, her, her, her whole view of everything, I have a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, a couple of sticks, I'm going to eat this food, we're going to die, we're going to die. But Elijah says to her, do not fear, do not fear, do what I tell you to do, the God of Israel will come, he will strengthen you, and he will help you. I wonder when the last time was that you spoke to someone and said, you know what, my God will help you with your problem." The God that I know will be a blessing to you. Have confidence, have, have faith in the God that we serve. So verse 14, like, like I compare this to like when David was fighting Goliath. The whole army of Israel was afraid of, to fight Goliath, and Goliath, little boy, chirps in and says, my God, the God of Israel will go before me, and we will fight this, this uh, giant Goliath. And so have a confidence that God is bigger than our problems. If we're going to make the most out of what we have, we have to have a confidence that our God is, ex is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we think or all that we imagine. He is able. Amen? And verse number 15, number 6, is this. If we want to make the most out of what we have, we've got to learn to bless other people. So Elijah, in verse uh, 15, just a summary, he, that woman and her son and her household were blessed by Elijah's presence. I wonder when the last time was that you could say that you were a blessing to somebody. You blessed them, maybe, maybe not even in giving them anything, but just put your presence there to talk to them, to listen to them, to be a part of their experience. You're, you're a blessing to them. But if we're going to fulfill our calling in life, we have to be able to be a blessing to other people, to put ourselves out there. And with that, there's always the chance that, guess what? You're going to get burned. You're going to get hurt. 
And I, I, you know, if I, if I added that up, I, I'd have a whole other book to write, but it's all right. How many times was Jesus burned? He put himself out there, be a blessing to other people. And then the last thing is verse number 16. If we're going to make the most out of what we have, we have to walk with this attitude that our God does supernatural wonders. Nothing is impossible with God. He does the extraordinary. He made that flour last. He made that oil last. You know, they never ran out. They had food for a long time. Three years, they had food. And so we have to live our lives with the expectation that my God is able. My God is powerful. Nothing is impossible with my God. So let me just summarize that real quick. If, if we want to make the most out of what we have, and, and, and think about what, what you have. You, you have something. First of all, you've got to walk with God. You've got to learn to walk with God all the time. When, when, when trials come, when difficulties come, you have to know God is able to see you through those storms. Number two, you've got to walk through the problems of life. This whole prosperity message, I think we could throw it out the window and burn it. But God will help us through the issues. God will help us through the problems. The brook may dry up, but God will open up another door for you. We need to learn how to walk in faith, not by what we see, but walk in faith. If you're ever low on faith, think back on your life, how God was faithful to you, how God saw you through some difficulties, whether health issues or money issues or people issues or whatever. Think back how God was faithful to you and draw strength from that. We need to learn how to walk with people, realizing that I'm a people too. I need to walk with people too. Other people need to walk with me. We all need each other. This is God's plan, that we are the church. We're a, a church of people that are depending upon the Lord. We need to walk with confidence and a, an assurance in our heart that my God is able. My God is stronger than the problem. We need to walk with the attitude of, I want to bless somebody today. I want to be a blessing. I don't want to be a hindrance. I want to encourage someone. I want to bless someone with my words, with my, with my ear, with my attitude, my disposition, maybe even my money if I had it. Amen. And I want, to be a, I want to learn how to walk with the, with the idea that our God is a supernatural God. He can do things supernaturally. I can tell you things in my life, and, and I don't talk about money a lot, but I can tell you one thing. When we, put, when we follow God's principles for finances, I don't know how he does it, but he blesses us in return. I'm a witness of that. Sometimes I, I look at my account, and I don't even know how the money got there. If I thought about it, I could probably figure it out, but I know that God provides for me. You know, I, and we've been serving the Lord a long time, and we have certain financial responsibilities, but my God has supernaturally provided for us. Amen. And so to me, that's a sign and a wonder. I think about other things, about, about people, about our family, about our, our loved ones. When we first came to the Lord, I, I really thought, I, I was so naive, I thought the number of born-again Christian people was like this big. I didn't realize it was a great movement. I never knew that. The church we went to in North Carolina had maybe 20 people in it. I thought that was a big church back then. And then I thought, man, nobody in my family will ever come to Christ and be a Christian. Little did I know. There's my nephew, my niece, my mom, my other niece, this one and that one, my good friend over here, my good friend over All these people are Christians. God's working supernaturally in many people's lives. We need to have the attitude. So when you have a loved one that's far away from God, guess what? God loves that person more than you do. And God cares for your son, your daughter, your grandkids more than you do. These are things I have to remember. If I could get saved, anybody could get saved. And God is able to do it. He's a supernatural God. We have a problem at work. We have a problem with people. We have all these different things. My God is able. Can, I, can we just trust God to work it out for his glory? I've seen it so many times. Lord, what am I going to do about this situation? If I do this, that's going to happen. If I do that, that's going to happen. I don't know. I don't want to do, do, go there. I don't want to think that. But Lord, what am I going to do? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And sure enough, he helps us through those things. He's a supernatural God that does supernatural things. So I'm going to stop right here because the rest of it would take way too long. And Lord willing, we'll get to that next time.
So I want to I want to go into a time of communion. Uh, does everyone have your communion set up? If you're at home, uh, you have a few minutes. Get a piece of bread or a cracker or and a cup of juice or something. And uh, we're going to just consecrate this time to have communion. And as we do this, uh, let's remember that Elijah was fed by the ravens, the meat and the bread. As we partake of the bread today, let's remember we're receiving the word, we're receiving Christ and uh, his presence in our lives. So let's, let's open it up. If you're at home, you can take your bread. And uh, before we partake, <clears throat> the question is, who may partake of communion? Well, you don't need to be a member of this church to partake of communion. The proper way would be for a, anyone who has accepted Christ into their lives is welcome to partake of communion. The scripture does say if there's a, a problem in your life or with other people to make it right before you partake of communion. But every head bowed for just a moment, I want to give everyone here, those at home, an opportunity. This service has been pretty full today. We've worshiped We've prayed, we had a baby dedication, we had the word of God, and now we're having communion. But I don't wanna miss the main point. The main point is that Jesus Christ has come to save sinners, and we're all sinners. And we're here to celebrate his death and his resurrection, his promise to come again, that's what communion is. We're here to celebrate his death on the cross and his victory over death. But let's not lose the main point. The main point is that he came to save sinners. So when I say these words, is there anybody here this morning, anybody at home, that has not yet come to a place in your life where you know that you're forgiven? Today's your day. You can know that you're forgiven. Is there anyone here today in this room that has come to this place where you recognize your need of a savior? You may know all about the Bible. You may know all about the cross and the story. You may even know about Elijah and the widow of Zarebeth. But do you know Jesus? And we don't want to partake of communion as a formality, like, oh, we had communion, but no. We're re-establishing our relationship with Christ by partaking of communion today. So without anyone looking around, I'm gonna ask you to be brave and raise your hand or stand up if you need to accept Jesus Christ into your life today before we go any farther. Raise your hand or stand up so that God could see that you mean business with him. Is there anyone? If you would, stand up, thank you. Very good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Water baptism. I 
think there's going to be three children getting baptized and some adults. This is a wonderful thing. A couple of kids just raised their hands to receive Jesus. Can I say this? Sometimes in a church, when we're a family church, when the children get excited, guess what? Everybody gets excited. When the children have a heart for God, guess what? They lead the way. I think I'm sensing that right now. <laughs> and that's a good feeling. We have some kids standing up for Jesus today, some kids getting baptized in water tonight. Yeah, that bears witness with my heart. Me, I was 26 when I accepted the Lord. Other people are younger, other people are older. All I know is that today is the day. So let me just ask one more time, then we're going to move on. Is there anyone else with these brave people? Raise their hand for salvation. Any, anyone else want to say, I want to be saved today? I'm not sure I'm saved. I want to make sure that I'm saved. Anyone else? All right, then. Sometimes in life, the brook dries up and we get weary. We start looking for water in all the wrong places. Now, we didn't renounce God. We just don't follow him anymore. We still believe in God, but we don't follow God. And you have to know that that's not good enough right there. So I want to raise this question. Is there anyone here today that you know God, you believe in God, and you gave your heart to God, but your brook dried up and you're looking for answers elsewhere? And you realize it's time for you to get back in the river of God. It's time for you to get back in that place where God could speak to you. Well, you're here today. That's good. But before we partake of communion, it would be good if you would say, Lord God, I, I, I've been away. I need to come home to you right now before I go any farther. So is there anyone like that? I just want to get back on track. Just raise your hand. Don't, don't be afraid. I want to get back on track with God. Thank you. any wonder at that last supper <clears throat> Jesus was with his closest comrades he was with people and we're having communion with people with amongst people today but I wonder how many of us could say to the Lord Lord God I love people but I'm having some problems with people right now I need your help in dealing with issues and drama. I think the Lord would want to help you with that. So at that last supper, Jesus took bread and broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Father, Lord, some in our circle today are saying to you, Lord, come into my life, forgive me of my sins, establish your kingdom in my heart. We pray with some of our children that want to put you first in our lives. We pray, Lord, with others that are having a rough go of it and we've gotten sidetracked. Our brook has dried up and we, we don't know, we, we're going to the wrong places. And we're coming back to you today. 
So Lord, as we hold this little piece of bread in our hands, we're reminded of the great price that you paid in purchasing our salvation. So Lord, thank you for allowing your body to be broken and bruised and spat upon and uh, nailed to the cross. Thank you for giving your body as a living sacrifice so that we would be spared of that punishment that we deserve. So Lord, we gladly remember what you did today by, by taking this bread. And we pray, Lord, as we do, that you'll just remind us, not only mentally, but remind us spiritually of the great price you paid to make us have freedom in you. And we gladly receive it. We gladly receive it. But Lord, help us to appreciate it. And we give you thanks and give you praise for your broken body today. Let's partake of the bread together. supper was over, cup and blessed it and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in which there is remission of sins. Take and drink as often as you do in remembrance of me. So Lord, thank you for shedding your blood on Calvary that paid the penalty of our sins, which are many. It's not only what we've done, Lord, it's who we are. And so we thank you, Lord, for, for changing us, for covering us. Thank you, Lord, for the blood covering where you don't see our sinfulness anymore. You see a new creation. We pray, Lord, that as we partake of this cup today, that the reality of the blood would be in our heart, mind, soul, spirit, that we'd be appreciative of what you've done for us. And Lord, as the as song says, and as your word says, there is power in the blood. By your stripes, we are healed. And there's power in the blood to forgive and to cleanse and to empower us to live godly lives. So thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed on Calvary. We apply it afresh to our lives today. In Jesus' name. Let's partake of the cup together. Well, let's stand together if we can. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, to do this until Jesus comes again. He's coming again, church. So we'll do that until he comes. Let's pray one more time. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us throughout this service today, for hearing our praises, hearing our prayers, speaking to us through the word, and uh, we, again, we pray your blessing over the, the NATO family. Bless little Silas, Lord, and let him be a great light to a great many people. But Lord, may we leave here today encouraged that you have a plan for our lives. Help us to make the most of what we have as we put you first and foremost in our lives. We thank you and we praise you for it now. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you.